syndrome. Um, I'm sure that you all know or get to know through the website. Tamsin Dillon, who is now head of exhibitions at Tech Digital, and previously she was director of Art on the Underground. And today she will talk, us, talk to us about um, public art commissioning through her experience, obviously. So, uh, Art on the Underground, and then more recent projects such as Lights Out, and, um, and also you said you're going to talk about Fort Flint as well. Yeah, yeah like another example. Camera is not going away. Hi. So, it will last about one hour, um, and so less than usual. And, and then we're going to go to Mendo Mendo, correct? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Ta da! <laughs> hello, <laughs> thanks, Francesca. Um, um, yeah, so, hello, everyone, and thanks very much for coming along. I've just come from the tape. So, after um, a day of being there, so forgive me if I dry up from time to time. And, and please don't, even though this feels quite formal, um, you know, feel free to ask any questions as we're going along. Um, and I'm yeah, going to talk to you about three projects that I've been involved with in different ways. Art on the Underground, that I was the director of until earlier on this year, and pretty much kind of established in terms of the format that it, that it currently runs to. Um, uh, Lights Out, which is a very different um, way that I worked with in collaboration with various different other kinds of parties. And the Fort Flint, I sit on the um, commissioning group for the Fort Flint, so I thought I could tell you a bit about that as a process um, and a different way of working um, to commission art for the public realm. So, I mean, that's, I guess that's the kind of theme for this um, presentation. Um, and I don't know if you have all heard of Art on the Underground, and, you, and it's something you either know about or have um, even experienced, hopefully, first hand, if you uh, regular visitors to London. Um, but as I say, I'll just, um, just jump in as and when. Um, so I was going to start by talking to you about one of the most, one of the pretty much the last project that I was involved with um, as a way of introducing the way that, uh, the, you know, one of the different ways that Art on the Underground really works to bring extraordinary art projects by um, professional and different kinds of artists at different stages of their careers. Obviously, Mark Bollinger, is probably one of the most um, well-known, well-established um, artists there he is, talking about this particular project <coughs> that you might have worked with. But we, um, but on the underground, works with artists internationally based and at all stages of their career, from you know students working at the London's art schools right through to people of Mark's um, status. And and this project, um, Labyrinth, um, was quite a landmark for Art on the Underground. So then, have any of you actually seen any of the um, Labyrinths on the Underground or, or know about this project? Um, so that was very much something we wanted to... I think that thing was cool. Yeah. Yeah. We have been to some parties before. <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> Can anyone hear me properly, by the way? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bit, uh, um, yeah, I think one of the one of the key things we wanted to establish with, with the Labyrinth project was um, to try and um, take the programme to a different level, if you like, and, and to engage a, an even broader audience than the one we had before. And of course, London Underground serves um, nearly four million people every single day, and that's that's the kind of audience numbers or audience figures that we that potentially the programme has. So it's quite an ambitious <coughs> um, plan to try and reach an even wider audience than that. But the um, the different the different um, strategies that, that Art 
the underground deploys throughout the, throughout the, the, the underground and has been doing over the last, um, say, 10, 11, 12 years is to, to um, engage artists from the outset in asking them what their response is to travelling on the underground, what their response is to um, what their response is to um, that particular context. And rather than, uh, we try and, I'm not there any longer, I keep saying we, but we, we try to keep the briefs as broad as possible. And in this particular instance with Mark Bollinger's project, um, the brief was simply to respond to the fact that London Underground is 150 years old. It is the oldest transport, underground transport network, railway network in the world. Um, and it has um, an incredible um, connection with culture, with, with design, and with art as an integral part of what of its brand and of its existence. And um, with its anniversary that came up last year, it was quite a, an extraordinary opportunity to invite an artist to make a work that would um, cut across the entire network somehow. Um, and also try and represent London Underground in a, a, or add a new kind of um, a new element to what London Underground could be con conceived of. And I felt that um, Mark Wallinger was an appropriate artist to invite to do this for a number of reasons. He's born and bred Londoner and has uh, been using the Underground all of his life. It's something that he um, has been familiar with, I think, since before he could even <coughs> speak, because he grew up um, right next to the underground, would have heard the, the underground trains kind of running at the bottom of his garden. And I think for that reason, he's um, been interested in making works in the past um, with the underground as the kind of core concept. You, you might be familiar with the work Angel that he made um, on the longest escalator on the London Underground uh, Angel Station. Um, and another work um, which actually is taken, it's a film that's actually shot from the front of a carriage, of the um, carriage, of um, the front carriage of the circle line. So it just kind of loops round and round and has a single um, dot at the front of the, um, in the centre of the film that um, focuses the film um, as it's going along. And we also worked with Mark um, on one of the other strands of the Art on the Underground programme, um, which is the tube map cover series, which I'll come to in a, a bit later on. And Mark was really excited to um, be invited to be the artist to work on this particular anniversary project. Um, because I think, you know, it's an incredibly, um, it's quite a challenge for an artist to try and come up with something that um, isn't just um, quite a, a sort of gimmick response or kind of something that, that can actually embed itself within the institution whilst also um, being something that has, that will have longevity, if you like. Um, and what he's quite cleverly managed to do, I think, with this project is actually embed, he's, he's kind of re, he put his own brand, his own stamp on the whole network. So what he has done is insert this um, series of labyrinths, and it's a, there's a unique labyrinth design in every single station on the network, and there are 270 stations. Um, and he was interested in the, the idea of the labyrinth um, because it relates very much to um, the idea of the journey and of course, the, um, does, does anyone know what the difference between the labyrinth and the maze is? Okay, well I'm sure some of you do, but I'll tell you in any case. I mean, the, lab, the labyrinth is a much older invention. It's at least, um, I think it's been established as being at least two or even 4,000 years old, whereas the maze is a relatively recent invention, which is 
designed to kind of trick you with, with fake kind of pathways and so on. But the idea of the point about the labyrinth is that you can follow one single circuitous path right to the centre and back out again. So um, for Mark, that very much symbolises what everybody does on the tube every day. And um, by coming up with a unique design, and you'll have been seeing the different designs as I've been going through, they each relate to this kind of family, different family of designs for each of, behind each of the, the unique um, things that you see there. Um, but they relate to some designs that, that, that come from this sort of um, Greek history or Roman history or even histories that go back beyond that. Some of them relate to kind of Irish, Gaelic kind of um, traditions. Um, and there's a, the, the history of the labyrinth kind of extends globally and you can find um, evidence of the labyrinth in you know, myriad cultures across the world. So that was another way of relating this project to, um, to lots of different layers, lots of different stories. Um, and so um, Mark's idea of uh, trying to relate this come up with a, a way of thinking about what London Underground is all about. Obviously the journey, the kind of stories of different people, what, what it means to travel on the underground was something that um, he thought about. And, and in terms of the process, um, I actually started talking to Mark about two or three years before we actually realised this project and it took the whole of last year to install all of these different labyrinths. Each one is actually made, um, it's printed onto um, vitreous enamel. So vitreous enamel is a, is a material that is used throughout London Underground for, um, for signage and other kinds of information, basically, and has been used historically on the Underground, I think, pretty much for the last hundred years. So um, what these objects do is kind of link very much to what um, to, to what London Underground is all about in lots of different ways. I think that's that's what the beauty of this project is. Also, you know, whilst these images kind of really demonstrate um, how visible these works are, they're, they're, they're hidden away in some ways, in some respects, in different parts of the, the stations. You have to find um, spaces and get permissions um, signed in triplicate or you know, even more um, sign-offs than that for each, each individual one um, in order to complete this project and complete the series. Um, so you can imagine the process for each and every um, work installed on, in 270 stations was quite a, a laborious task. But the, um, the other thing about the um, about the physical nature and quality of these these objects is that they they very the, the print quality very much kind of leaves something that you can feel on the surface. So people do spontaneously go up to these things and, and trace the the actual um, line. I mean, obviously these these images are somewhat staged, but um, it does actually happen that that's very much part of the, the kind of process of embed embedding and engaging um, our audience there. Um, and when we initially talked to Mark about how to come up with something, um, to Mark this very kind of auspicious, uh, this very auspicious kind of anniversary, um, I think he felt that it was um, going to be a huge challenge, particularly because we ideally wanted to produce something that was going to be permanent. And um, as you'll see with, with, with some of the other projects that I'll tell you about, um, the programme very much is based on producing um, normal, tem temporary or ephemeral projects as much as it is um, about permanent productions. And I think conventionally or traditionally people think of public art as, um, as something that's permanently placed in the, in the public realm, but obviously, you know, that's something that's been questioned and changed 
very much, in, particularly in the last 50 years, I would say. But um, I'm interested as a curator in the nature of what that means and uh, thinking along with artists and other kind of partners and collaborators in, the, in how to respond to different contexts and environments. I mean, you're familiar with, um, obviously, the Gormley's um, work at Crosby Beach. And I don't know whether you know that that work was originally intended as a temporary work, which is quite an extraordinary thing when you realise how, um, how much work would have gone into installing it there. Um, and I think it's a very, one of the biggest questions around permanent and temporary projects is how that decision is made. And, and if, if a temporary work becomes a permanent work, what the um, process is behind making that happen. So um, just returning to Labyrinth, um, I think we wanted to make something that would become part of the London, part of the underground um, culture and its service in the same way that many other aspects of its service exist now. But we, but you know, Mark was given entirely given the challenge of coming up with this idea. Um, it was his proposal, in fact, that it should go into every single station on the network, and that there should be perhaps one giant, you know, I think he originally thought that there would be a cast of something in, in every station, and then a, a sort of mother copy of it in the main office, or something like that. But so once he'd come up with that idea, he then had to come up with with what that thing would be. And it was quite a while before he established what the, the idea of the labyrinth. Um, but I think the, the, the use of the, the, the way that he kind of started to realize that it could be um, made with this particular material that is, you know, will outlive all, every one of us. Um, he could start to understand how possible that was. I think the other key thing that you notice about this, the labyrinth, is that of course it's it's round and it re very much kind of um, relates to London Underground's very well-known brand, the Roundel, and um, the, the sort of size and shape of this <coughs> graphic symbol very much relate, you know, relates so well to that. I think what he's what Mark's managed to do is kind of um, reinterpret what London Underground's brand is and, in, and, and using the materials and, and the sort of lexicon of London Underground's symbols, if you like, and which are quite many and various, um, and insert something new into that family of, um, of symbols and, um, and, and sort of alphabet of um, or lexicon of symbols. And I think that's what's uh, really clever about this, this particular project. Um, there's a kind of, if you look on the, the Art and the Underground website, you'll see um, that the, there's a sort of microsite dedicated to the whole labyrinth project. And of course, um, it was very important to use the whole year as it went along to uh, work with a wide range of partners and um, collaborate with, with um, educational institutions as well to really kind of embed the, the whole idea of what the labyrinth was. Because um, what's also quite unusual about this series of works is that there is no, um, you'll, you'll notice as we go on, there's no kind of label or interpretation of what it is Near, um, near any of the works, and that's pretty much a first for Art on the Underground, I, I think. Um, so people kind of have to figure it out for themselves, or I think we rely very much on, uh, on the audience, the visitors, to, um, to, to be sophisticated enough to, to seek out the, the answer to what those symbols might be themselves. But there was a very wide-ranging programme uh, that focused 
on all the schools in London and, and um, a lot of um, youth workshops so that what we were actually doing was working with the next generation down, um, which is a really good way, by the way, of um, getting in touch with their parents and really kind of reaching a very wide range of people. So um, there were sort of many strands to a kind of public program for this project, very much focusing on young people, but also um, on other kind of ranges of audience. So we worked with uh, the Science Museum, where we did a series of talks about how labyrinths actually um, get made, what the process is of creating them, the, their connection to science and, and maths. We did um, a, a talk with Mark um, at the Purcell Rooms on South Bank Centre. We did a panel discussion at the Foundry Museum. So we're engaging lots of collaborative partners across London, as well as you know, working with schools, a huge media campaign, um, a massive kind of Twitter campaign as well. So um, as I say, the, the, the whole installation process took more or less 18 months. And I, as far as I know, every single one is now in place. <coughs> Yeah. What was the biggest challenge? I mean, we repeated the information twice, so maybe it's that, or maybe it's not. What was the biggest, like, but this biggest project, challenge for the I think it was literally the, uh, in terms of the physical installation of, of the project, I, I would say that that was probably, because it really focused on what it, it, it um, there was one individual person working within the Art and the Underground team. By the way, there are about five people in the team, and one person who's, whose role is to be a project manager and to be an interface for all the kind of technical side of um, things within London Underground. As you can imagine, there's, there's a whole range of different kind of, um, kind of um, levels of people or teams that will be involved in the running of the service, quite apart from the people who drive the, the trains and run the stations. There are the people that look after the, um, the signage, of the advertising, um, the cleanliness of the station, and then at night, each and every station becomes a hive of activity for a different reason, for maintenance and for capital investment programs as well. So um, the person you know involved in delivering this and all the other projects on the um, for the art and the underground room has to somehow find them you know interface with all of those people. So it involves I think finding a, a space. We had to actually employ a team of people to go out to every station and find what we thought might be the right places to install these things, and then get permissions. I mean, it's kind of tedious, um, laborious process, but um, sort of fascinating, I suppose. But then we had to find out who we had to ask permission for, from, for each of those, and check that once we got permission to put our labyrinth there, that would be, you know, they're, they're big enough to see, but relatively small, but, in, but every single square inch of every station wall is kind of mapped out somewhere on some kind of drawing and allocated space-wise to one team or another, whether it be for advertising, whether it be for the signage, whether it be for the, the tube map itself, or even for you know, the logo to go in the station. So I'd say that was um, for something that we wanted to go permanently across the whole network, that was probably the biggest challenge. But I think equally the media campaign, the public programme, you know, everything had to happen and be coordinated to happen and be delivered at the right time and, and with, I think, in a way, the way that things are happening with Biennial, with kind of peaks and troughs of activity, things that kept drawing people back to the project and, and, and kept bringing um, new audiences to it. So, you know, some new audiences came because of certain press stories that we managed to get, but then other audiences... Um, 
were made aware of the project because of the perhaps of maybe a, a new event or something that was happening. So it's difficult to kind of really identify a single huge challenge. I mean, for me, as the head of the program, actually selling the project to the senior management and getting them to believe in it, see the benefits of it, get them to support it and advocate for it amongst their colleagues right up to the mayor's office. Um, so, you know, not quite Boris Johnson would have signed this off, but, you know, go, go to that level. Um, and that's, that's something that Art and the Underground continually has to do for every single art project that, that it delivers. But I think in this case, because it's quite a conceptual work, quite difficult to understand why we would install some, something that looks quite puzzling on every single network, on every single station, and for the uh, managing director of London Underground to, to understand that and decide to get behind it and support it, that was, uh, I guess that was my challenge. And it wasn't particularly, you know, it wasn't necessarily that easy because he is not, he, the current managing director is not someone who um, necessarily came that easily to be an advocate of the Art and the program. And that's a whole other story, if you like, um, because he wasn't the, he's been the managing director for the last five years or so. And Art and the has been in existence for at least 10 or 12 years. Um, just quickly, we left quite a lot to um, talk to the staff, but I'll just quickly go through um, a few other projects. One of the other things that was kind of a first for, um, for the 150th anniversary was to invite 15 artists to make a, um, a limited edition of some sort that we could then um, market and sell bring funds back into the program. Um, and the way that the program is currently funded is very much as part of London Underground's um, customer services. Um, it's very much seen as a benefit for um, making the experience of travelling on the Underground the best that it can be. So whilst people are being transported through or, or using the service to get from A to B, quickly and safely, the other kind of aspect of what London Underground Service is all about is, is about how to make that experience um, a really good one, whilst related to its own history and related to what, it's, what it means to be in London. So for all of those reasons, London Underground invests in this art programme, but at the same time, um, the other kind of huge task that I undertook whilst I was um, there was to try and use that investment, that funding, to leverage funds from other um, potential places. So the Arts Council um, was one place that we targeted. When, uh, the Art the Art the Underground program isn't a regularly funded organisation. It's not part of the national portfolio, but um, has had a grant through the Grants for the Arts program pretty much every year for the last six or seven years because obviously um, what the program is doing is bringing art to everyone which is which is very much what the um, the mission and the vision for the arts council is and um, <coughs> it, it's not difficult to, to find the right kind of arguments for um, getting the arts council to invest in the program but also wanted to try and find get source, other sources of funding and I think thinking in an entrepreneurial way and allowing people to um, invest more personally by producing limited editions, which a lot of public galleries obviously are doing as well, is um, another way that we wanted to start working and the um, 150th anniversary is very much a way of, of starting that process. So those 15 artists um, produce these images. I won't go into the details, but um, we use them in lots of different parts of the network, such as this um, wall that has revolving, uh, a rolling program of um, exhibitions outside Southwark Station, and um, at Gloucester Road, which 
there is a link link to Gloucester Road Station, which is the kind of um, starting point for the Army Underground programme. And I don't know whether many of you will have seen Gloucester Road Station or, or know that that's where the whole programme kind of um, started, started life, really, um, at the beginning of around about 2000, 2001. So um, basically what you're looking at is uh, a redundant platform on the, on the district and circle line at Gloucester Road. And for some reason, um, it wasn't being used in the walls, that the, the archways weren't being used for advertising or signage or, or anything at all. So um, it was decided to try an art programme um, in 2000. And um, it wasn't, artists weren't commissioned to make work or even respond to that particular environment, but they were, uh, people could apply to just exhibit their existing works um, as long as they were compliant with the, with the actual environment itself. So you can't actually you show combustible, you, you know, show combustible materials there. It has to be completely fireproof. Um, and it also has to comply with quite rigid um, rules in terms of the content that you might see. So nothing that's necessarily going to offend people um, in any way politically or no, no kind of explicit nudity, that kind of thing. So um, those are kind of weird guidelines and constraints that the, that the programme broadly has to respond to. And it um, um, turned out that this experiment was incredibly popular. People love to see these um, strange, quirky things that were exhibited at that point um, at Gloucester Road. So London Underground invested further, and that's when I came on board as a curator to start thinking about how to expand the programme. And um, what I did, what we're looking at here are some examples of some, this is the current exhibition you can see by Trevor Kaplan, who's a, a New York-based artist. And what he's done is make an amazing panoramic photograph taken um, in Yorkshire of the, surveillance, the American surveillance station. Um, and I don't know if are you familiar with Trevor's work? He actually did have a piece um, in the last biennial two years ago. And his, he very frequently uses photography, but um, I think he's interested in revealing what um, is not easy to kind of necessarily um, see in terms of the way that different governments are um, constantly um, putting us under surveillance. So what <coughs> He's done here is to is use the medium of photography again to reveal um, something about an English, what looks like a traditional <coughs> English landscape, but um, what you see if you look carefully when you're there at the station is the, the incredible golf, famous kind of golf balls that are the American surveillance stations so nestling there in the, in the landscape. But what he wanted to achieve was this. Um, this uh, image that looks as if it's literally there on the other side of that wall, as if you're looking through a window. Um, and then the different kind of responses that we've had in this space, this one by Sarah Morris, um, <coughs> uses the image that she made as part of the um, images for the posters for the 2012 Olympics in lots of different colourways. So actually, as you come into the station, on the train, it sort of almost has a kind of flicker book effect as you're going. And there are 19 arches. Um, the arches are all, uh, I think they're about five meters high, two and a half meters wide. So it's quite a spectacular space to view. Um, the first project that I commissioned there was to work with Cindy Sherman, and this was four images from a series of ten that she made especially for the site. So um, this exhibition really marked the starting, the, the sort of turning point for the program. Um, in lots of ways, we, we commissioned work specifically in response to the site. We worked in collaboration with another organisation, and that was the Serpentine Gallery. So this project 
happened simultaneously with, a, with an exhibition that Cindy was having at the Serpentine Gallery, so we could work together on, um, on the creative side of the project, but also the marketing and PR side, which led to the raising of the profile for the programme and for the gallery itself. And also very much raising the kind of bar, setting a very high um, bar in terms of the calibre and status of the artists um, themselves. So um, moving forward from there, the next project um, was a very important one for Mark Titchener at that point, um, where he, I mean, I think Mark's an artist who's very interested in bringing his work out to the public realm, and he has done that many times before, um, but particularly since. But this became um, a really important moment in terms of his understanding of using different kinds of materials, thinking um, how to work large scale and how to play with the context like this. Obviously, I think a lot of the artists that we work with on the underground are interested in the fact that primarily the, the, the kind of messages that people are getting other than signage and information are about selling them things. And um, I think that's something, because it's a very particular context, Context in that way. Um, a, lot, a lot of the artists are kind of interested in undermining and, or, or, being, or critiquing what that actually means and what kind of messages are coming through to people. And um, Mark was actually, um, so I think one of the big things for me as a, as a commissioner of work is to give artists an opportunity to really push their practice. And if that's that's worked, you can really, even with an artist who um, has been making year, work for many years, I think that really definitely is something that would be said for the Labyrinth project that Mark Wallinger produced, and it's certainly the case for, for Mark Titchener. Um, and he was uh, nominated for the Turner Prize as a result, um, partly as a result of doing this project with us. Um, this, again, this is just a snapshot of um, four of the 19 arches um, we <coughs> see here, but um, a very different work by Beatrice Mignard, who's one of the most important um, artists working in Brazil, and um, he took on this, this project as long as we could actually um, produce this work. These aren't printed, um, they're actually individual vinyl cut-out pieces which had to be each one individually installed. And it very much, in that way, reflects her actual artistic practice. Um, so I think in every single um, project, the thing is very much about having a conversation with the artists about how they want to work, being clear with them about what the constraints and um, limitations might be to what we can do, but always working with them to realise their project to the very very best of our ability as if they were working in a gallery I and mean, that you know the very highest quality of work is what people expect working at the Tate of course and um, we always intend to bring that to um, the Art on the Underground programme as well. Um, this project was very much uh, what I like to call a Marmite project by Brian Griffith. Uh, people either loved it, absolutely loved it, or really hated it because um, they thought it was quirky and funny and did something with the platform that hadn't really been done before, which was kind of transform it into something that could be a display of objects like as you might see on, on a sort of mantelpiece or something, but also make it look like it could be an assault force that someone could follow from one end to the other. And then the people that didn't like it felt that it looked messy, it kind of, it kind of pointed out the things about them, the un traveling on the underground that made them feel less safe. But I think that's what's interesting about working with artists, um, and particularly about commissioning artists and coming up, uh, inviting them to come up with a, um, a response. It's always quite unexpected. This wasn't when I invited um, Brian to make a proposal, this, this wasn't 
exactly what I was expecting him to come up with. So, um, you know, it's always an exciting and interesting process working with artists on this level. Um, that's the, I'm sure you're all familiar with this map, but uh, and it's, it's one of the elements of London Underground's kind of brands that makes it one of the most famous brands in the world. It's, I think the logo is um, still in the most, the top 10 most recognized brands in the whole world and has been for quite a long time. And I think what's remarkable about that is that um, it doesn't even, it's not a commercial brand. And all the other brands that would be in that list certainly are, and it doesn't advertise itself in that way. And it's only, you know, the perfect, it only reflects one institution in one city. It's not a globally based brand like Nike or Google or whatever. So it's quite an extraordinary thing. And I think also the map itself is probably very well known across the world. But what we, the reason the, 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 the show you this image is really to give you an understanding of um, where Droxton Road Station is, which is right here, which is you know, where all those um, projects are happening, compared with the whole um, network itself, which is, which is where I wanted to take the program next and how, you know, how to think about how we could do that. And one of the kind of obvious ways of thinking about that was to actually, God, it's 24 seven, wasn't it? Um, to focus on one strand at a time. Or sorry, one one line at a time. So we did a number of, we, and I think it continues, um, projects that focus on um, one line after the other, inviting artists to respond to different stations on that line or make a response of that kind. So the, um, the first line that we worked on was that actually the Piccadilly line, um, but then um, we worked, as you see, on the um, on the Jubilee line. Um, Again, this image shows a work by Jonathan Goodwin using the wall outside Southwark Station. But what we're looking at is a whole series of drawings that he made of staff all the way along the line. What he did was actually record the conversation that he was having with them as he made the drawing. And, and on the website, you can actually see the drawing appearing whilst you hear the conversation and the kind of, you get a double portrait. So you, and hear the person talking about themselves, and they're quite remarkable drawings. And what the, the impact of that was to really kind of um, raise the profile with the London Underground staff, engage the staff, so bringing them in as kind of advocates for the program. And that's something that's been um, really at the heart of what the, what, uh, the work of the program has been. Who's that? Um, Dryden, sorry, Dryden Goodwin. Um, and it's worth having it, that you can still see all the little films on the website. He's an incredibly good draftsman. And when he started, <coughs> we in fact invited all the staff along the line um, what their ideal project, art project would be. We gave them that chance and they said they wanted it to be a portrait project. And I think they thought it would be quite a conventional portrait project. And Dryden came up with this remarkable idea of making a series of drawings that represented every station on the line, every level of staff on the line, including the drivers. Um, and I think um, once he started making the drawings and people could see how amazingly accurate the drawings were, the staff were kind of queuing up to have a go. So, um, but it, each one probably took over an hour, and he, so, and he made over 60 of these portraits. So, it was an incredible um, project for him and for, um, I think, for the programme. Um, and then the other key uh, kind of turning point again for us on this project was making this work with John Gerrard at Canary Wharf Station. So we established this enormous screen where we um, presented this work for a year and then subsequently actually were able to use the screen for a, an ongoing film programme so that we could start representing moving image works in a much more dedicated way, which is something that 
um, we haven't been able to do so much before. Um, then the next line we focused on was the central line, and I'll just show you one project from there, which was Michael Landy. Again, very much engaging with um, staff, but also um, users of the tube by inviting people to tell their story of um, an act of kindness that they'd either been, um, you know, party to in some way, or witnessed, or been um, been given. And we got um, over a thousand stories sent in, and Michael's little drawings were then used. To, to sort of embed these stories and what he wanted to do was for people to just kind of come across them in random places across, so from, from I think there were 52 stations on the central line. So uh, again, over the period of about a year, 18 months, we, we installed all these different stories and you can also read them um, on the on the internet. And people, it's already it really does kind of um, touch people's, I think people always want to hear those kind of stories are quite fascinated by them. So we were quite surprised by the <coughs> by the speed at which they started coming in once we put this kind of call out for them. Um, another key way of really reaching those audiences across the network has been the ongoing series of commission on the tube map cover. And I suppose this is one of the projects I've, I feel um, has really been incredibly successful because uh, it's something that people have started to come to expect a change of the of the tube of the image on the front of the, the tube map, and it's something that artists really um, like the idea of because it goes into so many people's different hands, as it were. So, 50 million of these get produced every year, and um, if not more than that, as things go on, and. Um, since 2003, every single, every six months or so, a new work is made specifically by an artist for that. Um, and you know, it's, this is the current one by Rachel Whitey, and Daniel Grimm um, will be making the next one. But currently, it coincides with um, a, a, an amazing permanent work that will be by him that's um, going to be part of Tottenham Court Road Station when the whole redevelopment of that station finally comes to fruition at the end of this year. And here's the sketch with the famous logo that I've been banging on about all evening. Um, in um, 2008, it actually was itself um, 100 years old, so we invited 100 artists to um, respond to the logo and to make a new work of art that mess around with that. And here's a few, just a handful of them, from Peter Blake to Liam uh, Billick. Um, I can't remember who the others are. And then eventually we reproduced every single one of those hundred images in, in a book. Um, but the thing that we also did with those, I mean, what it, what it then, um, led us to have was kind of bank of images that we can use at short notice in lots of places all over the network. Um, because as you can imagine, even though we try and, you know, try and find space um, that we want to use, we quite often um, the spaces that we get given are given on short notice because they're not being sold for advertising or whatever. So needed to have a flexible range of images that we will be able to use and that ideally we commissioned ourselves to um, to respond to the network. But um, I'm quite interested in the Art Everywhere project that I'm sure you're all um, aware of and familiar with. One of the first things, and I think that's a really interesting way of um, putting art in front of a very in front of an audience that would never necessarily think about going to a gallery. Um, and one of the first things that I did when I started working for Art Notre Dame was invite a whole range of galleries, commercial galleries as well as public galleries, to send us images that, that they would be happy for us to make posters with so that we could sort of um, immediately start spreading the project across the network. And it was a project called Go to the Gallery. And I feel it very much echoes what the Art Everywhere project is trying to do, and I think it's, um, it's great to see that, that happening. Um, but similarly, that's kind of the premise behind the, the Rounder project that we did. 
um, and here's the studio and then Wolf Street program. And again, very much delivered in partnership with um, specialist organisations, I suppose you could say. So we start, started out by working with London Film and Video Umbrella, who commissioned one film specially and then showed films from their kind of back catalogue. And we've done that, we worked with the British Film Institute, with um, Bird's Eye Film Festival, and I think that they've now drawn the whole programme to a close, which is a bit of a shame. Because as you can see, it was quite a spectacular thing that you could see from um, quite, a, quite good different parts of the station. And, and again, drew a very different and varied audience. I think I'm going to kind of flip on. Um, this was a project by Jeremy Deller, again, very much about engaging a very wide audience. He wanted to, we asked Jeremy basically, what would you like to do in response to the underground? And he said there were too many announcements, so he wanted to have a day without any announcements at all, which I thought um, would have been fantastic, but uh, might have meant that the whole service ground to a halt. So we didn't even ask permission to do that. And so he said, okay, the <coughs> opposite of that would be to add to those announcements. And um, so he created this little booklet that very much resembled a kind of staff booklet with loads of different quotes by famous and not so famous people, um, which, pe which the train drivers and people who run the stations could actually use as part of their communications with, um, with the public. And this became a really popular, popular project. We put out this huge um, campaign of posters out to ask people to listen out for them and let us know if they heard them. And again, you know, we got uh, a really strong response. Every single communication that we put out about the programme encouraged people to go to the website, leave comments, get in touch with us, feedback. Because um, as you can imagine, it's quite difficult to know how people are responding to projects that you put out in the public realm, and you have to be quite imaginative to think about how to do that. But when you've got, when you're working in a place like the underground, kind of got a captive audience and it's a question of thinking about how to get in touch with them and, and get them to get in touch with you. I think it's getting easier because everybody's on Twitter and Facebook and you know they, they can make a very quick response but um, you know that was something that we had to think about really um, carefully in, particularly in relation to this project with Jeremy. Um, we are there, the, uh, I mentioned the Daniel Romain project that you'll be able to see soon as part of Tottenham Court Road. And this work by Jackie Consolet is covering this huge new electric substation at um, Edgware Road. Um, and it's kind of part of the um, <coughs> planning commission from the local authority that an, art, an artwork was involved. So um, and these patterns all reflect Jackie's research in the local area. So you'd be able to see patterns that are derived from water, from leaf patterns, from joins of cars. If you look carefully at all of those patterns, and it's made again with vitreous enamel, so it will last as long as uh, certainly as long as the um, substation is required, if not beyond. Um, and this work is the cladding of Green Park Station, commissioned by John May. Um, so we, over the years, we've kind of started to become trusted. Well, the art program has been, become kind of trusted uh, cultural arm of London, what London Underground is about. But I, I suppose the message that I wanted to convey is that that was um, something that had to be quite hard fought over a uh, number of years. And the, the point that it's got to now is that um, the program is now kind of um, diversifying into the other modes that Transport for London represents. So I think they've just produced a project for the um, river buses, which I think is a series of posters on the different river bus piers, and then also be going on to the um, road buses as well. And the idea is to establish a um, charitable trust that will be responsible for, the pro for running the programme so it becomes slightly more independent from London Underground and hopefully puts itself in a position to try and um, look for more funding that will um, allow the program to grow. Now, I've been probably talking for far too long already, and I was, I was going to talk about um, sort 
to other subjects, like out, which was part of um, 1418 now. And were you all familiar, aware of the 4th of August, which was the start, the 100th anniversary of the start of World War One? And I worked in a very different capacity, um, just as a kind of um, co coordinating curator, if you like, of setting up partnerships with four different organisations, Edinburgh Art Festival in Edinburgh, Artists Mundi in Wales, um, Factotum in Belfast, and the Something Else production to be made, um, an app with Jeremy Della, all of which were about making art um, making commissions specifically to be realised on the 4th of August as part of Lights Out, which was um, a campaign to encourage people to mark that moment and think about and reflect on the moment when World War One started um, on the 4th of August. But, I mean, it, they, these events were very much um, a sort of starting point for people and encouraging people to do to, to set up their own events and or even to just sit at home, turn all their lights out and just have one candle that represented that moment. But it was quite a, um, a different way of working and quite an interesting um, and refreshing way of working having uh, moved on from the underground. And what you're seeing here is a uh, Bob Roberta Smith's project in Belfast um, where he worked with numerous um, community groups to make um, a large version of a statement using where each different group was responsible for creating a different letter. Um, and the statement that he um, put forward, which was what unites human beings is huge and wonderful, what divides human beings is small and mean. And um, the idea was that the, over the preceding few weeks, there were workshops involving hundreds of community groups, or hundreds of people in a number of community groups, to create these um, specially designed letters in which sat, sat the, the candles that were lit and created on, on the evening of the 4th of August. And that was um, cited by the project in um, Belfast City Hall. Then this was Bedford Williams' project at Bangor, which was basically a collection of images taken from um, the Welsh Digital Archive from that time and made into an amazingly moving film where all of these faces, they look kind of like inky stills, but they were um, actually morphed together into one single film, which lasted <coughs> an hour. But the one that you might most most have been aware of was the work by Ryoji Ikeda, presented by Art Angel in London, right next to the House of Parliament called Spectra, and it was quite an amazing light that was then left on over the following few days. With a, basically, I think it was a grid of something like um, 20, I don't know, kind of <coughs> searchlights just pointing straight up into the sky. So I'm going to stop talking and just go, just kind of quickly whiz through, um, I think, pretty much all the different projects that have been on the top of Pope over the last few years. Um, as I say, I, I sit on the commissioning group of the Fourth Prince, which comprises a range of different people Matthew Slotover, who's a director of Trees, um, Jeremy Della. Um, the head of the mayor's office for culture, Justine Simons, Joseph Perry, and um, uh, who else was the Becca Eshin is the chair of the group. And it's quite a, it's a very different process as you can imagine, but what but what happens is we as a group come up with a very long list of artists that we would be interested in putting a proposal forward for the for the pro for the project. And then when their proposals come in, we between us shortlist them um, down to six who then have an opportunity to make a, um, a prototype or a, a, a small model, um, after which we then finally make a decision about 
who are going to be the next two artists represented on the fourth plinth. But obviously, the length of that process allows for a, a wide um, kind of public program to be part of it and for people to respond to what's happening. I think that's become a really important part of the process. Um, and there's quite a history to how this project got going. I think it's now become um, a really important part of the what, you know, public projects in London and um, raise, raises the profile of contemporary art, raises questions around what contemporary art can be, and, and I think it does a, a, a similar job you like to the Turner Prize in, in terms of getting people thinking about what contemporary art is, what it can do, and, um, and introducing people to it, thinking about it. This is the Dormley one and other project. Um, you can show the garden, I'm bringing the drag set, and the one that's there. <laughs> Sorry to have rambled on. It's well, so I'm very interested in the, the question of the Instagram project and the scale of what you've done is so much grander and uh, more, I think, wide ranging in what you can do than, than what they have in their work to potential poetry there and mm. in the abstract spaces. Um, would you like to start collaborating with literary arts on your work now? We've definitely, I mean, they as well and, and expanded the programme in terms of that, that way of thinking. I mean, certainly um, all of the um, Lime Base Commission, Lime Base series have been accompanied by um, publications that have meant that we've invited people to either um, write a text in relation to the theme or uh, actually write some, like Francis and Key wrote a sort of um, short story in relation to it and there's actually a, a, a big publication that's coming out soon in relation to the Labyrinth project and Will Self is one of the writers that have been invited to, to contribute a text to that. Um, I mean I know what you mean about the, the poems on the underground but it's an incredibly popular programme and the, the woman who runs it um, and established it back in the 80s um, is an incredibly powerful person who's pretty determined and tenacious. And, and I think that's probably a good thing, although I'm, you know, I always feel that there's a lot more potential for the, for the poems in the underground program. But that well, I suppose what she, what, what the poems on the underground program does is kind of give people a very particular moment of reflection and um, those those uh, on in car kind of advertising panels are the most lucrative ones on the whole network because you do actually have people sitting there looking at them and, and reading or you know they're quite they're the most difficult ones to actually um, get a, get a hold of but um, in another way they seem the most appropriate place for a small piece of poetry I just always wanted to maybe commission some new poetry rather than you know, a lot of the, the poems that are sh sh um, shown are out of copyright basically they're you know um, and so they're the, they're the easiest to actually use um, yeah I mean I think there is huge potential for the future and what I hope is um, that it does continue to thrive and grow well definitely I think the idea is um, they're looking at more kind of live art kind of projects. Um, the new the new head of the program actually comes from uh, Tate Modern, but from a very much from a different perspective. I think she was involved in the um, the, the live art program that was in Tanks, um, but from a curatorial management side rather than. Um, from the actual curatorial process, but we'll see where she takes it. Silence. Any other thoughts?
towards, I mean, are any of you um, working towards a career, career as curators? Is, is working in the public realm something that you plan to do? Or, you know, if you're going to work in, in galleries with collections? Yeah, I was thinking about Getting a position as a curator. Yeah. And, and how are you going about well, planning to do that? Well, are you, are you, are you um, an, an art student? Have you been an art student? Or? Well, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's not uh, at the university or the high university. Right. Right. I'm, I'm also trying to like, do more to work with the private art, a little more about you know, art and how the galleries are run and curated. Well, that's a definite kind of starting point. Yeah. But what, um, I think what you're always going to need are um, the right kind of ground level qualifications as well. So that's yeah. another important, um, that's an important kind of thing to have. That if, and at the very least, you know, a very active, consistent um, kind of interest in going to exhibitions and um, participating in every kind of, at every level and in every way, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Including writing about mm -hmm. art as well, I think that's an important Yeah, I do that also. Um, how did you start? Like, how did you begin getting interested in Well, I, I mean, I suppose I've been living and breathing art since I was fairly young and originally trained as an artist. Um, and then worked, actually, you know, my career's been quite, um, <coughs> quite varied, I suppose, because I then went into the theatre and made uh, props and scenery in a lot of the London theatres for a little while before going back towards the art world and um, did my MA at the Royal College of Art and Curating. And that's, but throughout that period, I suppose, I've always been interested in um, how you bring art to a new audience, and as well as you know making the experience of going to um, visiting galleries and bringing art to a knowledgeable audience. What happens when you put art in front of people that aren't necessarily expecting to see it, and how do you make sure that that's relevant in terms of the artist practice as well as that audience, not making it just some kind of um, strange spectacle or something that is the theatrical, but something that um, that has depth and, and, and rigour to it. Um, and I think that's that's something that I that is remains at the kind of core of what I'm thinking about all the time, and what it means to what public space is, what it you know what public is because I'm, I'm always um, careful about how I talk about the public realm because there's no such thing as kind of free public space in a way every everywhere you go is every, every space that you walk through is actually owned in some way or another either by a local authority or by a corporate entity or and so there are always rules and regulations around every everywhere that you that you can be in, and particularly you know, make those change depending on um, which part of um, this country you're in, but which country you're in as well. And I think all of those um, those constraints are um, what interests me about how artists respond to that. So. Sorry? You try to create it in the street. A great one. Yeah. Um, not necessarily, but maybe um, push them a bit or, or raise questions that, that kind of um, make people aware of them when they may not have been aware of them. I think that's what a lot of artists are interested in doing. Um, just by something quite small and subtle in terms of an intervention, like the images um, on the front of the tube map covers, can raise questions in a, in a, in a really subtle way. But thanks for the question.
partnerships, collaboration. Um, I, I find it more and more that the first place for me, the thing is to, uh, not, not to work in isolation and to really um, try and, in every circumstance that I find myself, to, to figure out who else is interested in that same thing, how to kind of establish a real a strong foundation and a network of like-minded people, or even people that aren't necessarily like-minded, but who I can think I might manage to co-opt into um, whatever the project is, and, and or at least understand with everything that you might want to achieve, there are going to be stakeholders that are going to be friendly or not so friendly, and um, it's about seeing uh, things from their perspective, from their point of view, and get finding out what's going to make them come on board. So I don't think it's necessarily as simple as, I think there are some straightforward kind of ways of thinking about how to apply for funding, but I think um, any project is going to be more successful if there are um, people that are taken into it, if, if the kind of people that are going that are going to be impacted by it are taken into account, if that makes sense. I'm not, does that, does that make sense? I mean, that's something that I find more and more to be the case, that by, um, rather than starting on your own to try and achieve one thing, figure out who else is, is um, going to help to achieve that. And it's, and it's a, you know, there's no, there's also no easy kind of, Something that's going to have an impact and really work well, there's never going to be a simple way of achieving it. So it's about kind of having a vision, deciding what you want to achieve, and sticking with it and being determined about that as well. And I think that's probably the, the thing that's kept me, um, allowed me to achieve the things that I've been proud of, is that I've been very single minded about it. So that when it's come to trying to persuade other people because of my passion for it, I've been able to come up with the, with the, the rationale, the words, whatever it is to, um, and if, if the first answer is no, then I don't necessarily take no for an answer. I come up with another way of going back to that same person or that same group of people and try and understand their position more, understand why they've said no, and if there's a way to, to make them think again. And that, but that, as I say, it's about kind of being really clear about what you want to achieve and, and sticking with it. Commitments, I think. Thanks. I've got a question. Uh, when you were doing art on the underground, um, I noticed that a lot of the artists interacted with the actual kind of front light dark set. Is yeah. that something that you actively thought we need to do this as well because at the end of the day we are the people the public who yeah. perhaps interact with so how do you actually get them on board as well? For each project I think is a different um, process involved and again you know it's very much a learning process I can see over the years um, there was a kind of series of strategies that became part of what we need we realised that we needed to do and um, I think what's interesting about working in a big network like, like London Underground is um, communication is a huge issue and quite a problem really because you've got a huge workforce of over 22,000 people and they're spread over a huge area and a huge network and you can't be there looking after every individual project. Um, so thinking, finding out what the um, existing modes of communication with those staff are and figuring out whether or not we can um, have some kind of voice there. So there's a, there's a regular magazine that goes out to all the staff and the underground. We wanted to do projects to make sure that we could have a presence in that magazine. And wherever possible, we did work with artists or um, volunteers, other kinds of people that would be prepared to go and meet the staff at the station or whoever was going to be involved in that project so that they would have a sense of um, ownership over the project that would be 
advocates for the project, and um, we would also need to listen to their um, issues around things so that they would actually feel inclined to actively speak positively about each and every project. But it's, a, it's a, an ongoing thing, I think. That's the thing, it's, never, it's a job that's never done or completed, but I think we consistently start to um, realise that it was an integral part of any project right from the outset. Right.
to say that there is a straightforward answer, except to say, to, to try and um, invite people to um, think differently about, about what they know and take and, and understand that I don't think art is something necessarily that you should understand immediately, personally. I think you, like anything, you get out of something what you put into it, and if you don't put any effort or work into something, why should you get anything out of it? And, I, and if something, um, I suppose my answer to, to people that might say, well, I, you know, I got it before, but I didn't get it now, to, ask, to kind of throw the question back at them and, and ask why they think that might be. Is it, you know, because it's not being necessarily made deliberately obscure or difficult. It's just, um, there's a dynamic that's changed and there's, there's something else that they need to take into account whilst they're looking or thinking about it. It's not, you know, I don't think there's any way of making it easier for them. There isn't a kind of a panacea that you can offer them to, to um, they just need to either engage with it, whatever it is, and decide whether they don't wish to engage with it any longer or they put more effort into engaging with it. And, and, but it, that, that still leaves them with the freedom to have, you know, to make their own mind up about it. that have kind of um, produced 
something that's that they've been thinking about is very much part of their practice over time, and it's and it's um, you know it's not something that can be understood immediately necessarily. 